video includes paintings of the human figure and may not be suitable for some younger viewers. Now as we start getting older, our skin starts getting a little looser and we start developing lines and wrinkles and all sorts of things. So doing a portrait could be a bit complicated in an older person. Uh, but don't get overwhelmed by this. Just maybe concentrate on one small area at a time and just realize there's their overall shape, like let's say the head, but within that we have these extra shapes from you know, the aging skin and so forth. And never forget this, the basic principle of painting. As the surface, in this case skin, faces toward the light source, it's a little brighter, and as it curves away it gets darker. So even something as minute as a wrinkle still has that uh, characteristic to it. It's like a groove in the face. So unless you have the light and the dark, it really doesn't look right. It might look like somebody just drew a dark line on someone if you just use the dark only. And because this depends on how skin folds or wrinkles face the light, how this looks can change if the subject moves, if the light source moves, or if you, the viewer, move. And these things are also true for things like the hands and the feet. There's lots of details to worry about there. Uh, there's tendons and veins and knuckles that protrude out, so they should show some volume and there should be a light and dark and we should understand the direction of the light. You kind of see there's really no flesh uh, in the knuckle area, so it tends to see a little more blood flow under there, so it's a little redder. The knuckles protrude out and the tendons also can be seen when you're doing certain movements. So there should be a light and shadow on all these things. There's a light and shadow on the veins, on the tendons, and on the knuckles, and then the fingers and the hand itself overall. So remember about all these details around the body, but don't get overwhelmed by any of this. And Just always remind yourself of the simple concept of which direction the light is coming from and show some light and shadow on every detail of the body and the face. So here we have where we see younger hands and faces. Uh, they're definitely more rounder. You don't have so much, many details in there. There's more fat in the flesh there, so it's a little plumper looking and softer looking. And uh, there is the overall shape of the head to worry about, but don't get too crazy with the details of veins and things like that. It wouldn't really make sense on a, on a younger person. So your values should be much softer and much closer in range to have that soft look. Otherwise, it will look like things are protruding out when it comes to veins and tendons and things like that. Painting faint, soft lines with some variation in them is usually enough. Forget about any distinct light and shadow colors. In fact, most veins are not seen at all. It's important to keep in mind skin color is no different than any other subject. The more color frequencies contained in the light, the more color variety is possible in the skin. You won't see colors in a surface that aren't first present in the light, so there will be less color variety in skin seen under light such as man-made fluorescent, incandescent light, candlelight, moonlight, or even sunset light. All these are missing certain frequencies, resulting in a dominant tone. Mica, however, often prefers the variety of skin colors only found in neutral, natural daylight. The colors in skin also come from the nature of skin itself. Up close, it's a pigmented material growing in all directions and should be painted as such using dabs, not strokes, if painting realistically. 
Aside from the values creating form, the skin color itself has similar but slightly different colors mixed in it. Mixing these colors on the painting itself, rather than only on your palette, helps one create this effect. Using a uniform skin color can be painted to show form, but will always look more like paint rather than actual skin. Here, the same artist paints using color variety, but in a style which is clearly intended to look like a painting. Last, he paints the elements in realism, including skin color variety, values showing form in all aspects of anatomy, all within a carefully rendered drawing. When painting darker skin, look for surrounding light reflecting into it. This is a more defined highlight shape and is not the same as light simply making the skin brighter. Since lighter values reflect into darker surfaces, the darker the skin, the stronger these reflections or highlights. Therefore, very pale skin does not show these highlights, such as the sky, nearly as much. However, a white surface will reveal any color present in the light source more than a darker one. The same applies if this light source is not the direct source, but simply reflected light bouncing off nearby surfaces. This can be a colored wall or the green from trees in its strongest in still lifes where colored objects are placed close together. Let's try something here. We're going to mix up a couple skin colors. Just kind of a, a raw umber base for making a darker skin tone. And just use white and probably make it a little pinkish with some red and a little cobalt blue in it as well to kind of neutralize it. We made a pale skin tone and a dark skin tone. The dark would be a cool dark using raw umber as a base with some cobalt blue to blacken the brown further. The pale mix would be mostly white with a small amount of cadmium red light to darken and a touch of cobalt blue again to dull the pinkish hue while darkening the value a bit further as well. The typical Caucasian skin would be darker yet with more of an orange tan hue to it. Use your warmer colors and warmer browns to accomplish this. And we simulated daylight. We have a natural daylight bulb above us. Okay, so that's going to be giving the temperature of these skin tones no matter what. You will notice the tone or the color a little more in the lighter uh, tone, just like you would in something white. And then if we tilt this just the right way, at just certain angles, you have a bright highlight, like a reflection, like a mirror. That's what we are talking about when we have reflections on skin or any surface. In this case, it would be the sky above someone if they're outside, but it's just in certain places. And it's stronger on the darker tone because darker surfaces reflect lighter things stronger. That's just the way reflections work. Finally, an oily or wet dark surface is also smoother yet, showing reflections strongest of all. So just to be sure and look for that, if you're looking at some reference, those strong highlights, and it can be quite strong sometimes. Don't be afraid to put some really bright highlights on someone with darker skin. Be sure to add that if you're painting from your imagination having to make up these things. But not to worry, this is actually very easy if you understand. Look for our shows on painting water since they explain everything about reflections. You should actually just forget about it. When I do a portrait, I have trouble with the eyes. Could your show show me how I can improve on making the eyes better? 
Now, when you're painting the eyes, really have an understanding of what it is you're looking at when you're painting them. Uh, eyeballs are rarely white. There's usually some type of gray. Sometimes there's even a pinkish hue to them because there's blood vessels in there. But rely on your complementary colors to make those grays. And just remember, you know, what is this eyeball? It's kind of an egg-shaped thing. And as it curves away from the light, it becomes a little darker. So you're going to have some darker grays in there. Uh, and realize what the eyelids represent. The top lid is the one that really folds and covers the eye. The bottom uh, lid really doesn't do anything. It's just down there. But the top lid is what comes down. It's tucked under, uh, up into the eye socket like a fold of skin going into the skull. And it actually comes down out of there and covers your eye when you close your eyes. So that's what that line above there represents. So you know, think about that. It's not just a line. It's the fold of your eyelid, you know, folded up into your eye socket. And even though people's eyes may function in the same way, look for slight differences in anatomy. Individuals will vary along with more common differences among ethnic groups as a whole. Notice here our model's eyelid does not tuck into the socket much even when open. This trait is common among Asian cultures. So, you know, think about that, but sometimes when people are closing their eyes slightly, you don't have so much of that. It's just a fine line, but it still might be a fold there. And the eyelids, both of them, top and bottom, are, they have thickness to them. So it's kind of like a shelf on the bottom, and often that will catch the light if the light is pointing downward. And those eyelids, because they are thick, often cast shadows onto the eyeball itself, and you'll, you'll see that in most uh, portraits. Uh, also, when you put the little highlight on the eyeball, uh, be careful with that and just understand what that represents. That's basically a reflection of the light source either in the room or outside. If it's outside, it might be more of a curved shape because it's really just the blue sky above, and that puts a little highlight on the top part of the eyeball. Uh, if it's a bright white dot, what that white dot is, it's really just a reflection of the light bulb or a candlelight or something that's shining the light on the scene. And you really see that strongly when you see uh, flash photos. So that's what that is implying. So if you're copying a flash photo, first of all, those are the worst reference. But if you're trying to do something with those, don't make that bright highlight so bright it looks like a flash of a camera going off in the room. Physically, the position of the eyes is at the center of the head, not more towards the top. The hair covering one's head creates this illusion. However, the center position is only seen when the viewer or photographer is at the same eye level as the model's eyes. If the model tilts their head or the viewer's eyes are above or below the model's, this is not the case. More face or forehead would then be seen. Also, when looking eye to eye and looking straight ahead, horizontal with the earth, the distant horizon line should also be seen at eye level. Our instruction on perspective explains this and much more in great detail. And if you're doing lips also, be sure to make the edges a little soft where it meets the, the skin. If you have a really hard edge on that the lip color it tends to look like lipstick, which it will. Maybe you want that if you have someone with some bold lipstick on. Now let's sink our teeth into this. When painting teeth close up, you may see the variety in shape. And naturally, even the nicest teeth are not pure white. The lighting also has to be considered. Also, don't paint the scary teeth look by making the space between them black, a common mistake. After all, they're white or cream colored. Why would they ever look black? Last, normal lighting comes from the sides or above. Therefore, the lips, having volume, should cast a shadow along the top. Without this, one would have to either be smiling up at the sun or taking a flash photo. Now we know better than that. However, strong light is, or can be, a great effect. Just avoid the type of direct light associated with a camera's flash. We just don't encounter such a light normally. Now one's ears are about the most complicated form on the human body. 
But if you simply slow down, take a minute to understand its form first and keep all shapes consistent with the direction of the light, it's not so horrible painting them after all. And look around for light bouncing around in the deeper areas. Unless you have very dark skin or very low light, these areas are rarely black. The same is often true for nostrils in the nose, even though many photos and video may look this way due to their problem depicting contrast correctly. The hair being smoother than skin reflects light even more so. These highlights may be just a subtle lighter version of the base hair color or a very strong bright reflection. And if the light has a distinct color temperature to it, be sure and include this in your highlight mixtures. This may be a cool light or a warm sunset light. Impressionistic paintings usually have broader brush stroke shapes, whereas our realistic paintings include fine lines representing the actual hair texture. Painting a few lines over a darker base, then blurring this will give the illusion of hundreds of soft hairs quickly. These individual hairs may have highlights and darks, just as hair groupings will, such as hair curls, and last, the overall head itself. And remember, natural hair has some slight variety in its colors. Don't just use one single color made into lights and darks. For any individual hairs, remember longer detail brushes hold more fluid, therefore they can paint longer lines. Last, when painting any type of frizzy hair, we first recall how only smooth surfaces show reflections. Water does, dry dirt doesn't. Natural dry African hair may look dark and will have light and shadow values, but won't have strong reflection highlights unless it is gelled or made smooth, as we see here. Now we try our hand at painting frizzy hair a couple different ways. First, we paint on a canvas made black using raw umber and ultramarine blue, then dried. These slightly lighter highlight colors were made by adding white to this black base tone, making cool highlights. Some red or yellow was also added for slightly warmer tones on the left side. Frizzy hair grows out towards you rather than laying flat, so we dab the canvas instead of painting longer strokes. We also lightly scrape the side of the brush along the canvas, creating random shapes. We then threw bits of raw umber, red, white, and blue into raw sienna and blocked in a rough face. This way our hair doesn't resemble some guy's toupee floating out into space. We use the same white and blue to fill in a background with the same raw umber mixed in to dull the colors. So here's the trick for this method. Very little paint is ever on our brushes and the paint is not too thin. All this is done so we never actually fill in the texture of the canvas and never fully cover up our dry base tone. This type of paint stroke is considered a broken stroke. If you paint in too much and things start blending too much filling in the canvas, just dampen your brush and pull out some of these highlight colors. Repainting in some of your black base color is another option. Both methods use the same dabbing strokes. Now to judge how things look a bit better, we applied one more coat on the face, covering up any background still showing through. We did the same for the background color, adding more contrast just as the face. In the end, the canvas texture itself creates the hair's texture for us, and highlight values are kept very subtle. For a less groomed type of hair, we use the exact same colors, but try a looser, softer look using bigger brushes. 
This time the overall shape will be more random, but we'll still let the canvas texture keep the hair's outer edges broken and soft. Using the side of the brush helps obtain this effect, same as before. And if our edges get too thick, once again we use our thinner and towel to dampen the brush. Dab again to pull that same paint out. The highlights are larger clumps of hair, painted a touch lighter by adding colors like red, white, or maybe some tan. Blue is also thrown into the mix for rear cooler highlights. As with anything, greater texture would be attained by letting this dry and repainting the final highlights over the dry coat. So we did just that. Let it dry, varnish with alkyd medium or retouch varnish, then dab in a few more final highlights, resisting the temptation to add too much. In this hair, being a rough surface, the highlights should not be too strong. Both styles of hair were done over a textured painting support like canvas. We applied the paint using the side of the brushes and any final highlights were done over a dry surface. Now there's no rule saying that you have to limit yourself to one style or another. Here we have a representational painting basically. It's a person's face. We recognize what it is. That's representational. Then it's very impressionistic though. Uh, we clearly see the paint strokes. The artist is clearly communicating this is a painting. It's not supposed to look exactly like real life. But then on the boundaries here, he went completely abstract. So he's combining different styles within a portrait. And sometimes those are the most interesting of all. Then we have artists that really paint using their imagination along with the portrait itself. Uh, so really think about that. You don't have to do just a plain background or a normal background that we would recognize. Uh, anything that you can think of out of your mind can really make a standard portrait much more interesting. Maybe something uh, that tells a story that you thought of that you want to illustrate with your painting and you can use a portrait as a means to get that across. For instruction on DVD or TV show availability, just visit our website or check your local stations.